On behalf of Alice and Mark and myself, I want to uh, greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and welcome you to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. We're continuing on in our study of where and how the church has strayed from the teaching of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. The purpose being is to get back to that place where we are indeed following the teaching. And I remind you that all scripture is the teaching of Jesus. Yes. Okay? You know, Paul wrote to the Apostle, uh, the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy and said, all scripture is God-breathed, all right? Profitable for teaching, reproof for correction, and training in righteousness. And, you know, that's what it says in 2 Timothy 3.16. And, of course, in, in the first chapter of John, in the first verse, it starts out with the Apostle John saying, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, speaking of Jesus. So, He is the Word. He is all Scripture. Yes. Uh, you may have some verses in red in your Bible, what Jesus but, they're, said. but they're all God-breathed, okay? Right. All right, so before we start, I'm going to ask Mark if you will once again ask God's blessing on our time together. Oh, Jesus. Lord, we just ask you to be with us and to... Uh, give wisdom to Butch and for him to make use of this time. Amen. Amen. We thank you, Father, that you are with us with your Holy Spirit. Yes. Praise God. Who was sent to lead us into all truth. And that's our desire, Father, is to come more and more to the truth because your Son, Jesus Christ, yes. is the truth. We've recently looked at the influence of Greek philosophy on the church. And now I'd like to talk about the influence of Babylonian religion on the church. Okay. okay? Mm -hmm. You have to understand that, unfortunately, the body of Christ, the church, has been influenced yes. by, outside, by, by outside forces. Mm -hmm. the, the Greeks at one point, the Babylonians at more than one point, uh, all right. Uh, but before we do that, because I, I have this in mind, before we start looking at Babylon specifically and how it's influenced the church, I thought it would be good if we would just take a, a quick look at the entire Bible, mm -hmm. from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, Revelation 22, as well as a study of the history of mankind from start to finish. Okay. And, don't worry, it'll only take a few minutes. That being the case, the logical place to start is in the beginning. In the beginning, God said, let us make man in our image, Genesis 1.26. So that's a great place to start. Okay. So he created the heavens and the earth, the earth to be inhabited by man. He made the birds and the beasts of the f and the fish of the sea and said that all life shall bring forth more life after its own kind. Right? right? Right. Then God formed man from the dust of the earth and breathed life into him. There's that God breathed life, all right? He formed Adam, placed him in the garden where the tree of life was, and then he put Adam to sleep and took from him the rib which he fashioned into the woman. I'm sure you all know this, right? Mm -hmm. But then Adam sinned. Having chosen to listen to what the serpent spoke to the woman, rather than to the word of God. Yes. That's, it's, it's, it is as simple as that, right? Mm -hmm. He disobeyed the Lord and ate from the tree, and he became deformed. And I don't know, you have to stop and think about this. If you don't recognize the fact, if you don't realize the fact, that sin in our lives is a deformity, okay, you're not paying attention, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And it is more of a deformity than, you know, what we read in the New Testament. The, the, the people who had crippled or, or lame legs and blind eyes or withered hands. 
Sin is a greater deformity than anything physical. So Adam, no longer looking like his perfect, sinless God, was cast out of the garden, out of God's presence, with his wife, Eve. The relationship with God was broken. Yes. And the Lord placed the cherubim with a flaming sword at the gates of the garden to guard the way back to the tree of life so that Adam couldn't get back to it on his own. Absolutely. Okay? Mm -hmm. So man went from being formed to being deformed. Okay. Now it says, the man knew Eve, and she conceived and bore a son. A son who looked like his father, after his own kind, right? Adam. He looked like Adam, not like God. Right. And from that time forth, mankind no longer comes forth in the image of God, but of Adam, yes. becoming the walking dead. Mm. Well, it's true. Yeah. I mean, I, you know how I know it's true? Ridiculous. Because that's what the Word of God says. Yes. Paul said in his letter to the Ephesians in the second chapter, he said, we were dead in our transgressions. So, in time, along came the religious leaders and false prophets, whether they're from Babylon or from Jerusalem, mm -hmm. who proclaimed, like their father the devil in the garden, that you can make yourself like God. These, quote-unquote, men of the cloth would have people believe that if you offer enough burnt offerings, mm -hmm. if you tithe enough, if you go to church enough, if you sing in the choir, if you could just keep all of their regulations, you could be right with God and once again be like Him. That is Satan's constant sermon throughout time. Yes. He believed it in his heart. It says in Isaiah 14, 14, which is a reference to him, he said, I will make myself like the Most High. Mm -hmm. And it was exactly what he proclaimed to the woman back in the garden. Mm -hmm. People believe that lie, starting with her. Yes. All right? He's saying, you know, if you only do this, if you do this work, if you eat this fruit, you'll be like God. Mm -hmm. So man went from being formed to being deformed to being misinformed. But in the fullness of time, hallelujah, yes. God the Father, just as he had promised, sent his son Jesus to do for us what we could never do for ourselves, to remove the deformity of sin through his atoning work on the cross. The second Adam came in perfection and lived in perfection in the very image of his father. Now, I want you to think about this, because I've said this in a couple of other programs, in previous programs. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ did not come, Jesus did not come to this earth to create or make a new religion. No. He came, he didn't want to start a new religion, he wanted to restore mm -hmm. an old relationship. Mm -hmm. That relationship that Adam originally had with, the, with God in the garden, right? So, through that gift of Jesus Christ, that perfect gift of love, it was now possible for men to be reborn, right? to be reformed. Mm -hmm. So now man could go from formed to deformed to misinformed to reformed. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay. okay. Well. True. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Yeah. From death to life. Mm. Death had been conquered when Jesus came out of the tomb. Yes. It and then he, call, he calls, this is God's word. God breathe. He speaks of us through the Apostle Peter when he says, but we, you, but he said, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, or a peculiar people, so that you may proclaim the excellencies who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. 1 Peter 2.9. Mm -hmm. Let's look at an example of that. Lazarus. Yes. That's the perfect example. Yes. Now, if you don't, I'm sure you probably know you can. If you don't, you can go to John 11 and read it. it wouldn't hurt you to go to John 11 and read it. Anyhow. <laughs> but when Jesus had heard that Lazarus was sick on the point of death, Jesus immediately waited. That's yes, true. Yes. His ways are still not our ways. Don't let anybody try and convince you otherwise. But when Lazarus was four days dead, 
Jesus came to the tomb. There's an appointed time for everything. And after telling the people who were gathered there to remove the stone from in front of that grave, this big stone that blocked the grave, he cried out with a loud voice and said, Lazarus, right? Yes. Come forth. How loud? Jesus called Lazarus with a voice loud enough mm. to penetrate the darkness of death. Hallelujah. He calls us all by name. Yes. Yes. If you have that right relationship with God today, it's because he called you mm. by name. And this is because this is personal. And he called you by faith because faith comes by hearing and hearing by his word, right? Yes. yes. So Lazarus was when born again, when Jesus Christ called out, Lazarus, pow, he had new life. He was brought to life. Yes. Reformed. Okay. He came to life in the tomb. And then Jesus cried out. You know, there may not be a comma between Lazarus come forth. Maybe a full stop period right there. Okay. Because when Jesus said the name, something happened. He came to life. When then he gives him an instruction, a commandment, and he says, come forth. You see, faith has to be coupled with action. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. That is obedience. Yes. If Lazarus had come to life but not obeyed the command of God, he'd still be sitting in that tomb, in the darkness of that tomb. That's right. And yes, it was a command, by the way. He'd be alive but still living in the tomb, the land of the dead. As all many, too many Christians are today. That's right. Did he come forth in the image of God? No. I hear you saying, no, 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 not quite. <laughs> and you rightly say that. When the Father called Jesus out of the tomb, and then Peter and John ran to the empty tomb, right? No, no not right. <laughs> because they found that it was not empty at all. Oh, yes, Jesus was gone. But the tomb wasn't empty. The burial wrappings and the face cloth, the garments of death, were still there. Jesus left them behind when he came forth. Lazarus, on the other hand, and we, on the other hand, came forth from the tomb bound, with, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with the cloth. That's John eleven forty four. So he came out wearing the, the garments of death. The trappings of death. We all do. That's the old habits, the old traditions, the old ways of thinking. They were still on him. So he had to be unbound and set free. He had to be transformed. Mm -hmm. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Romans 12, 2. So now, you see, we travel from being formed to deformed to misinformed to reformed to transformed. Yes. Da, da, da. That's five. <laughs> okay, well, I, I wouldn't even count. Okay. <laughs> now, transformed is going to bring us, because Paul wrote to the Philippians and said, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1, 6, right? There's a glorious promise that God started to work in us, and God can complete that, that work, right? Now comes, I think, one of the most powerful verses in all of Scripture. By the way, they're all God-breathed. Yes, they are. But please listen to this. Paul wrote to the Romans. This is, this is the book that changed Christianity yes. when... Martin Luther read it, right? Mm -hmm. Paul said, For those whom he, God, foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Mm -hmm. Right? Conformed. Yes. So now we've traveled from formed to deformed to misinformed to reformed to transformed and the goal at the end is conformed. You see, I hear people say all the time, we're all we're, we're born in the image of God. No, we are not. We're not made in the image of God. You're made in the image of your human father. 
That's why, and this, this is why Jesus said you have to be born, born again. again. Yes. You have to be born again. Because the sins of the Father are visited upon, you know, generation to generation. Now, remember that. Because that's going to become important as we get into take a look at Babylon. Yes. Mankind is not made in the image of God. We are made in the image of Adam. That's, that's the fact. Now, if you think that's wrong, prove it to me scripturally. Okay. That was the goal. Formed, to deformed, to misinformed, right? To reformed, to transformed, to conformed. Okay. Okay. But I say that I was going to go through the entire Bible. Yes, you did. So we started in Genesis 1. Mm -hmm. The whole Bible, we got to go to Revelation 22. From the first chapter of the Bible to the last chapter of the Bible. Okay. okay. It says in Revelation 22, 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. The way the gate has been opened once again. And this is the goal that we get back into the presence of God, restoring that relationship, and back to the tree of life. Hallelujah. Genesis 1, Revelation 22. The entire Bible, and the entire history of man, from beginning to end. What is that commandment that we are supposed to do that's referred to there? What's the commandment? You know, the apostles came to Jesus and said, tell us, what are the works we should do? Believe. He said, believe on me. Believe on him who will be sent. Right? Mm -hmm. The commandment is, way back in the, in the law, the commandment was, in Deuteronomy 30, 19, it said, I set before you life and death. The commandment is, choose life. Okay? The life is Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. you got to choose Jesus to get back to that place where you are conformed into the image of God and you are at that place, we brought back to the tree of life. Oh. The end. <laughs> so there's six. I, I, he was counting. Okay. He says there were six. Do them all over one more time. From formed to deformed to misinformed, misinformed to uh, reformed to transformed to conformed. Okay. And you got to be reborn to do all of that. Okay. Just a, a little P.S. Remember, it, it, it says uh, in Ecclesiastes seven eight that the end of a matter is better than its beginning. Okay. What's important about that is to understand that there's been this plan. God has always had a plan. God spoke to the prophet Isaiah and said to basically to the to the devil. He said, you know, go ahead and make a plan, but I will thwart it and turn it to my own way. God is in control. Yes, He is. All it takes is our willingness and our submission Amen. and our obedience, you know, to call him Lord. Amen. Then we can call him Lord and Savior. Remember, every knee is going to bow. Every tongue confess that he is your Lord. But not every tongue will be able to confess that he is Savior. That's right. All right. You don't have a choice about him calling him Lord because he is. That's he a is fact. the King of yeah, Kings. He is the fact. Lord of Lords. Mm -hmm. That's just a fact. You know, we're not going to take an opinion poll. We're not going to take a vote and vote on it. That's the fact. What the option is, is for you to call him Savior. Yes. That's the choice. Because he's, God the Father sent his son Jesus Christ into the world so that whosoever will, whosoever will, will accept that free gift will have eternal life. Okay. Now, I had a reason for doing that, but I want to start talking now about Babylon. As I said, we talked about a couple of shows, programs back, we talked about Greece. And it's the, the influence of Greek philosophy on the church. And it is mammoth. Yes, it is. It truly, truly is. I mean, if you look at some of the, the great, I put quotes around that, great theologians of the church who f literally formed the way the church is going now. I'm talking about Augustine and, and even Aquinas. They were so influenced by Aristotle and by Plato, right? By Greek philosophy. And that if we're going to be transformed, 
we have to be transformed by the Word of God. Yes. The Word of God is the tool that the potter uses to mold us and shape us. All right. So that philosophy not, not the has to be world. it has to be unwrapped. I got a question. Um, <laughs> those two guys took um, the Greek for the Greek for the Greek philosophy and put it into religion. Okay. Uh, Augustine and, and right. Yeah. But among others, yeah. There were other people who put it into politics. So well, we got to separate ourselves from that too. Uh, politics is the the world system. That's all it is. All right. Mm -hmm. There's no there's no politics in the kingdom of God. Yeah. But it 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 still came from the same three guys back in Greece. A lot of it. Well, that's what I said. I mean, that's, if, if you didn't see that particular program, to, to if you if you look at the program guide online, you'll you'll see um, we we talked about the the Greek effect of philosophy that. Went into the church, and it went from Socrates. It went from Socrates to Aristotle. To Socrates Plato. to Plato to Aristotle to Alexander the Great. Right. It went from the entire world. Yes, which were the Hellenistic Jews that we were talking about in Acts six. chapter six. Mm -hmm. That was that Hellenistic is the Greek influence, right? Yes. So, uh, but I'm going to show you that you know it's interesting that if you look at Daniel, the book of Daniel, mm -hmm. and when he is, you know, remember, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire have conquered Ju yes. Jerusalem and taken captive virtually most of the, all of the Jewish people back into Babylon. And one of the young people that went was, was Daniel. And in the book of Daniel, he talks about God used him to interpret a dream or a vision that Nebuchadnezzar the king had. And it was a you know, progression of four kingdoms. Mm -hmm. The first of those being Babylon. Right. right? Mm -hmm. And then the third being Greece. Okay. And the fourth being Rome, which is the one that will be there until the last days. Right. Okay? So, you know, this is in Daniel chapter 2. You can go, go look at it, this, this whole dream. Um, so there's a progression that goes on there. So, Babylon had a, an influence on the religion that we practice, yes. the faith that we practice, mm -hmm. even before Greece did. Right. right. Okay. And by the way, the, one of the differences is, I mean, the influence that Greece had with its philosophy is still felt in the, in the church. Mm -hmm. But Greece itself is basically gone. Okay. The question is, is Babylon gone? All right. Want to answer that question? No, you have to answer that question. The Babylonian Empire <coughs> influences the people of God from right after the flood, basically. You know, Babylon starts right, right after the flood, okay, mm -hmm. with uh, Nimrod, mm -hmm. okay. Nimrod in the plains of Shinar mm -hmm. founds the empire of the Babylonian Empire, of Babel, the city of Babel, the Tower of Babel. Right. He is the, the, the direct descendant of Ham, okay. one of the three sons of Noah, right. Okay, right. Mm -hmm. separated by a couple of generations. Ham is the son who was cursed by his father Noah for his rebellion, his rebellious mm -hmm. act. Okay. Yes. Now, remember I said it would be important, the sins of the father are visited yes. generation after generation. Mm -hmm. That rebellion of Ham... I'm going to say existed in Nimrod. Okay. Yeah. But what Nimrod did, and where this starts, this is like the first organized religion after after God basically destroys the the world with the flood, right? Mm -hmm. The first thing he does is they're going to build a tower to reach into heaven. Right. They are trying to reach heaven on their own works. Right. Right. God's plan shown. Right? Mm -hmm. In the time of Abraham, I mean, it was clear that he would provide a sacrifice that would make things right. The only thing that can make you right is that there has to be, you know what there has to be? There has to be the shedding of blood. It says, right, in Leviticus 17, 11, I think it is, 
There's that, no life without. There's life. Oh, life is in the blood. Life is in the blood. Right. All right. That, right. The offering has to be of blood because the life is in the blood. Right. right? That's not meaning that you need to cut yourself, but blood was shed mm -hmm. as an offering to make you right with God. That was the blood of Jesus Christ. Yes. Because as Abraham went up and sacrificed Isaac, or was prepared to sacrifice Isaac on Mount Moriah, which was an act of worship. Yes. God said, no, stop. I will supply. supply the sacrifice. And he did. He didn't, he didn't take Abraham's son. He supplied his own son. Okay. And it was represented at the time right. by the lamb. Right. The, the thing is, any other plan is rebellion against the Father. Yes. Because his plan is the only one that can work. It has to be a holy sacrifice. Mm. And that holy sacrifice is Jesus Christ. I, I, I'm going to skip again to the, to the end of, of the Bible. Just to put this in perspective. Because as I said, back in Genesis, mm -hmm. in like the 9th, 10th, and 11th chapters of Genesis, we're talking about the flood and then... then the, the rising of this quote unquote Babylonian Empire, right? right? But if you go to Revelations chapter 17, so now we're going to the end of the Bible, right? And I'm just going to read, and it's worth your while to go read the 17th chapter. Mm -hmm. but I'm just going to read a couple of verses, verses 3, 4, and 5. Okay. John says, And he, this, the angel, carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, full of blasphemous names having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a gold cup full of abominations and of the unclean things of her immorality. And on her forehead a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. The mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. Okay. Any, well, we're going to have to wait till our next program to get into this in any depth. Um, but I, I just tell you, I mean, you know, I, I'm not the first person to say this. I know that some people don't like this or have derided this, but there was a fellow, uh, a Scottish free Presbyterian, I think he was, uh, theologian back in the 1800s named Alexander Hislop. Who wrote a book called The Two Babylons? Right. right. right? I, I know you guys have heard of that. And then we have a dear friend in Manchester, England, we've been associated with in ministry, and he's a, a, a brilliant Bible teacher, I think. And he is doing a series, of, Alice has a copy of it here. Uh, and looking at a book, which you probably can't see here well, but it is called 6,000 Years of Babylon. It's a series mm -hmm. of books. His name is Morris Barat. Volume 3. Yeah, it's a multi-volume yeah. series, and he's done it on CDs and on videos and stuff. But people who are students of the Word should recognize the fact that the church has been influenced by Babylon and Greece, yes. any empire in the world, right? Mm. We're to be in the world, but not of it. So I, I think you're going to find this really, really interesting. Next week, when we get into looking at the details of, of the Babylonian religion and how it's influenced Christianity. But we don't have time to do that today. So, Father, I do thank you that we had what time we had. Yes. And Lord, I pray that we've used it wisely. Lord, and that you would just bless us until the next time we meet. God bless you and goodbye until next time. Stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. But I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners.